Okay. Um, maybe we should start. I think we're still waiting for some people and some people are going to just um, be joining us as we begin. Uh, and Hugo Leal says it's his fault. Uh, he's just finished a session with some of the students on the data school. So welcome anyway. So uh, my name is Caroline Bassett. I'm the director of Cambridge Digital Humanities, which is the host for the Cambridge Digital Humanities Social Data School. And this is a public event, which is both for people on the data school and an event where we welcome public, publics, anyone from the public to come and talk about the issues that interest us and that seem to us to be important. And in this session, we're looking at machine learning for investigations. And really, uh, we're partly asking what the use is of machine learning for investigations by turning the question round. And instead of starting with questions of the abuse of big data and machine learning, we're asking what can be done with it? What might be done with it in the interests of uh, creativity, in the interests of justice, in the interests of finding different ways to use information? And we've got two really brilliant speakers to start us off, so I'll be introducing them in a moment. But just uh, to begin, um, welcome everybody. Uh, lots of people have uh, joined already, and many of you have already begun to talk about who you are in the chat, and that's absolutely brilliant. Uh, we've got time for two presentations, then a big conversation and discussion. We'll be asking people to contribute in the chat with questions or you can raise your hand at the end uh, and we'll try and get a conversation going as informally as possible. Just a few things before we start. Uh, if you'd like to join the CDH mailing list, um, there are many ways to do it and Heather will put them in the chat. Heather Stallard is our uh, uh, comms officer. This meeting, just so you know, is being recorded or at least the, convert, the, the presentations by our, by our two speakers are being recorded. We'll keep the conversation itself informal and won't be recording that. So please feel free to, um, to, to, to know that that's, um, if not private, then it's nothing that's going to stick around, or at least we're not going to stick it around if you like. Uh, so uh, as I've said, this is part of the Social Data School, which is an online uh, school data school run by CDH and run by uh, Cambridge uh, CDH Learning. We also run in-person data schools and uh, there's uh, some information about that also coming up in the chat. So uh, you're very welcome to think about joining us in, uh, in other contexts and in other um, bodies. But welcome today. As I said, we've got two really great speakers. We've got Yuri Potter from Amazon Mining Watch Project, which is the Rainforest Investigation Pulitzer Center and uh, Amazon Mining Watch uses machine learning to map mining activities and their impacts in Amazonian countries. And we've got uh, Yorga Ruiz Reyes from the Oxford Internet Institute, Data Civica and Centro Geo, which uh, is looking at uh, clandestine graves in Mexico and, and mapping them and, uh, and also combining different digital methods. So welcome to both of you. And uh, I think Yuri is going to go uh, first. So Yuri, um, over over to you. And I think you're going to share your screen and a uh, big welcome from us. So uh, if you can just start us off now, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks for to CJ for CDH for having me here. Well, uh, I would like to talk about uh, the Amazon Mining Watch map that is a project run by here can you see it, right yeah we can see it a map yeah well this is the amazon money watch map it's a beta version uh we we launched uh, it in may 2022 it's basically uh Pulitzer center and f rise media organization these both are these these two organizations uh, joined together to be to to build a uh, AI machine uh, learning to detect a uh, gold mining pit in the Amazon, in the international Amazon, in the six countries of the international Amazon. Well, the mining pits are the yellow dots you can see on this big map of the Amazon, and it's. I will try to. Let me see this, the next uh, first. No, sorry, can I go back a little bit? 
the folks of my work, I'm, I'm a journalist, I'm a reporter. I'm not exactly a, da a data program programmer. I know a little bit about data algorithms, but I'm a reporter. So one thing that came up in mind uh, when, I, when we were discussing with Airfrise Media uh, specialists about why to build this machine learning tool, this algorithm to detect gold mining pits, is to try to find uh, uh, how, how, to create, how to find stories behind the, those pits. So one of the errors that we most that came up with most interested to us is this area right here in the middle of the map. You can see a lot of yellow dots. It's the Tapajós region in Brazil. It's the it's a uh, it's a region between three cities, Itaituba, Jacareacanga, and Novo Progresso. These three cities concentrate basically eighty percent of the illegal mining in Brazil. So this is how we can see it zooming. We can I don't know if we, if someone shared the 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 link to the map, but I can do it a little I can do it later to, really to play around a little bit. And well, this is the, the, the data that we have so far, right? They created the Earthrise Media created this AI machine to detect mining pits through satellite imagery. So they scrape the, the, the areas that seem, seem like um, gold mining pits on a satellite imagery. And we, find out, we found out these yellow dots. And so this is the, the data we have. So now how we can create stars, how, how, we can, how we can use this data to create stars. Well, in journalism, we always say that you, you, you need to follow the, follow the money, right? But in this case here, we need to follow the dots to find the names behind these dots. That's our first job. That's the, 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 uh, the main task here. So how to connect these dots? Well, we need to find uh, which person or company are connected, uh, are related to this area. We, we have uh, geolocated data. Remember, we have latitude and longitude from a, uh, a spot in the map, a dot in the map, sorry. And so we need to we need to find out who owns this land, or try to to discover who could be connected to this land, could be re related to this land. So could be a company, could be a could be a mining company, could be a cattle range. Uh, a lot of a lot of business can be connected to a a, a, a illegal gold mining. And it could be a person, a businessman, a politician, could be a straw man. It happens a lot here, especially here in Brazil. Uh, or this land could could be owned by the government, could be a protected area or a public public land, uh, could be an indigenous territory. Uh, so the sources that we, we use it to identify the owners of the 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 mining pits uh, are basically the first step is to try to find geolocated data, because this data geolocated data we you you give you a name and a location, a specific location connected to this name. So that's how we could try to find names behind the, 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 the gold mining pits that we detected on, on the map, in our map. So here in Brazil specifically, uh, we have uh, mine requests for, if you wanted to explore any kind of ore here in Brazil, you need to apply, you need to uh, register a mine request in the government and the, this go the government need to permit uh, the, the exploration of the area. So you, have, so you can have the name of the, the company or the person, could be a person, could be a, a, a small scale mining, could be connected to, a, to just one a person, not exactly to a company. Uh, here in Brazil, we have environmental finds also that have, that have uh, geolocated data, we have range registration, Register airfields. It is very important too. Uh, I, I can explain later. And of course, we can search on public company files to to try to identify uh, if one of these companies could be connected to to the air to to the air that we spotted on Amazon Mining Watch map. And none of this will replace the old journalism. You no, know, interviewing people, going to the field, trying to to, to 
discover more more uh, more news about more more information about what you are investigating. So you still need to talk with people. You still need to talk with employees. Uh, uh, I talked a lot with geology researchers, uh, university researchers, federal prosecutors, environmental lawyers, uh, local NGOs, and people affected by illegal mining in the region. And well, uh, let's get back to, to our map. Uh, this is one example of one of the, we, I zoom in in one big mining pit in the, in the region, uh, in the Tapajos, Tapajos region, the region that I, I, I said before, that is the most affected by illegal mining in Brazil. And as you can see here, you can see a, a, a big mining pit. This is, this, this is, is this big deforestation right here. And we see this road is a air, airstrip. It's a illegal, it's a illegal airstrip. And how we can identify if it is legal or illegal. One thing that is very important is that when Airfryze Media built the, the AI machine learning to identify, to detect uh, mining pits through satellite imagery, they detect everything that satellite can, can show. So uh, there's legal earth, uh, gold mines and illegal gold mines. So it's our job to separate this Two, two, two types of uh, golden uh, gold mining golden mining pits. So how can I how can I score here if it, this mining pit is legal or illegal? So what, one thing that I do is I download uh, all the data, uh, the shape files of the. You can do it on GitHub on the Amazon Mining Watch map, and I download it and upload it on QGIS. It's a uh, it's a it's a tool very, very useful to, to work with satellite imagery and geolocated data. So this yellow, this uh, airstrip here is this red, red dot that you can see right here on, indicated by the blue arrow. It's the same area. So this is the area that we have this big mining pit, gold mining pit. And the black polygons that you see here, which is, with uh, with stripes are mining requests. Remember that I said before that we can, if you want to explore or in Brazil, you want you you need to 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 register in the government a mining request to explore this ore. Could be gold, silver, whatever. And in this case, we don't have any kind of black polygon right here. So this is it's a illegal mining pit. So and. One thing that is more, more important than it, than it is that the red area that you can see right here is indigenous territory. So it's really, really illegal to, to extract gold in this area. So we have two, uh, two uh, illegalities. So they are, they are uh, exploring gold uh, without a mining request and within uh, indigenous territory in Brazil. It's um, the Munduruku indigenous territory. So this is one way to, to identify if the if this the mining pit is legal or illegal. You can see a lot here, right? Right. Here. Not not just within the indigenous territory, but outside the, the indigenous the indigenous land, but without a mining request. Like here. So during our investigation uh, on illegal mines. Uh, we found a lot of illegal airstrips too, clandestine airstrips, not registered the, by the government, because those airstrips are connected to, to and why do, those airstrips are connected to illegal mining? Uh, well, basically, you, we, we need to remember that we are in the middle of the forest, in the middle of the jungle, so uh, it's very difficult to reach some places. We don't have a road, you don't have a road, sometimes you have a, a river that can help you to, to find, to, to reach the mines. But if you go by boat, you, you take, it will take two days, three days to reach some point. And it's way more easy to buy uh, an airplane and to go and to fly to the, to the area. It will take 30 minutes, less than an hour. So to go to a illegal mine in the middle of the forest. And, and remember, we, we are talking here about a business that 
uh, runs billions of dollars every year around the globe. Well, uh, we use the same technology of the Amazon Mine Watch to identify illegal oil strips in the forest. So we find out we found out after after one year and a half uh, investigation, we found out we found uh, uh, twelve hundred uh, illegal oil strips in the, in, in the Brazilian Amazon. It's more just to just to to think about it. It's more than the airstrips registered by the government. You have more illegal uh, airstrips in the Amazon than legal airstrips. It's, it's a little bit crazy to think about it. And well, using those techniques to identify owners and to identify uh, uh, if, if the, the, the mining pit is legal or illegal, we, we wrote several stories uh, about, uh, about not just who owns the mine pit, but the entire supply chain. That is the most important, that's our tar target here. Not just say that, oh, you have a small co mining company in Brazil exploring gold in the, uh, within an uh, indigenous territory. Uh, no, we wanted to discover who owns this, uh, who, who, who buys this gold, which company, where this gold will end up, where this gold will end up. And so we did it with, uh, using satellite imagery, using geolocated data, but using uh, traditional techniques of journalists. Like we, we after we found the the who are the who are the 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 the, the, the mining companies exploring the gold, we 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 connected these companies to gold refineries, and those gold refineries uh, are very important to us the names of these gold refiners because if you go to stock the stock market websites around the globe you can see you can search for these gold refiners because for example in the united states the sec the uh, website the security and exchange uh, commission you the the companies are uh, obligated to to inform the suppliers of the, the their ore so on this way, we find out that Tesla, Amazon, Apple, Starbucks are buying gold from uh, suspicious companies connected here uh, in, in the Brazilian gold business. So one of the, the, the companies that we found, we, we found one of the gold refiners that we found was one based in, in Belém city in the north of Brazil that is owned by a Belgian tycoon sentenced by, by the Antwerp justice for creating a illegal gold market. He was sentenced, sentenced in 2021. It's this story that we published on The Intercept United States. We published uh, several stories about uh, an illegal gold mining company uh, here in Brazil uh, named Gona Gana Gold. We published this story in 2021, in June, June 2021 in October, the English version on Monga Bay. Uh, 10 months after our publication, the federal police here in Brazil uh, arrested the, the owners of this, company, of this company. And about the uh, clandestine airstrips, we published also a, a documentary about uh, uh, talking with uh, pilots that are using those illegal those illegal airstrips in the forest. It was very interesting because if you go to talk with them, it's very for them it's very it's very common. Oh, okay, I, I fly to a uh, illegal airstrip. Uh, it's not a big deal. We do we we are doing it since the eighties, and uh, it's some kind of uh, uh, curious things. You can you you can see we have this documentary in with English subtitles. I can show you a teaser. Uh, in a minute. And we also publish stories in, in collaborations with other, with other newsrooms. One of these newsrooms was uh, the Belgian magazine named Kinak. Uh, because as I said before, our target here is not just to find who, uh, which company or person are extracting the, the illegal gold, but where this gold will, 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 uh, will end up. And who is buying these goals, right? If it's Apple, if it's Tesla, whatever. So we we team up with the uh, 
Belgian journalist Christopher Clarks about uh, to write about the the Belgian typhoon, and they published a story also in the beginning of 2022, February. We also published a story with New the New York Times uh, investigating the the, the clandestine airstrips in the Amazon. One third of the uh, 1,200 illegal airstrips are connected to to illegal mining in the Amazon. So one one thing that is it was very very uh, uh, good is that the, the impact of what we get during this almost two years of investigation. The first story about the, the Brazilian company, uh, Gana Go, uh, Dell Technologies uh, United States answer us that they, they, they cut it off, this company, the, the, the Belgian refining company from their supplier list. And uh, our, last, our latest story was about the, about the illegal, uh, the illegal asterisks uh, Apple sent us a, a, an answer, a similar answer about another uh, suspicious uh, gold refinery here in Brazil. It's the biggest gold refinery of Brazil, Massa Massa Metal Metals Refinery. Apple answered us after two months of conversations. We explained to them why we were we were writing about this this gold supplier. They answered us that they cut it, they also cut it off. Marsan from their from, from their supplier su supplier list. So this this is the kind of impact that we 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 tried since the beginning of our investigation. You know, to try to understand the entire supply chain from the from the forest to the final buyer, and to try to stop it. You know, uh, I think that is the best way to 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 stop some some uh, some illegal business like some international illegal business like this so uh, that's it i don't know if i i got all my my time i will try let me let me try to show you my no sorry here i'll try to run a teaser of the documentary about the pilots uh, we 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 talked with pilots that are flying to uh, clandestine airstrips connected to uh, illegal mining, but we also talked to pilots that are using those clandestine airstrips for other reasons. For example, we talked with a, a a doctor that is also a pilot. He 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 has his own airplane and he goes he, he pilots his own airplane to go to uh, indigenous territories to 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 do treatment. Health treatment to to indigenous communities, and we talked with a, we talked also with a, a, a pilot that is working with an environmental NGO here in Brazil uh, that also are using uh, these illegal clandestine uh, airstrips, not registered airstrips in the in the forest. So I don't know if you, if you gonna hear. Can you hear the? We can't hear actually, but we can see, and there's subtitles. Okay. Great. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Rui. We'll go um, straight on to our next presentation, I think, and take questions that will arise around both projects at the same time. That Hopefully that will help us to, to get a conversation going. But thank you for that presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, our next speaker is Georges uh, Ruiz Reis, who's from the Oxford Internet Institute and Data Civica. Geocentro and the University of Ibo America. 
and is supported by Amnesty International, which is a lot of places all at once. Um, so welcome again. And, uh, and uh, George is going to talk about uh, looking at uh, unmarked or clandestine graves in Mexico and, and about how uh, uh, machine learning can be used to think about them. So over to you and welcome again, thanks. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to, like to thank uh, the Cambridge Digital Humanities Center and Irving for the invitation uh, today. I'm very happy to be here and I'm glad to share the space uh, with Yuri, Caroline, and with such a broad audience today. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and start uh, talking about our latest project that we have uh, conducted in Mexico to locate hidden graves. Uh, can you conf uh, can anybody confirm if uh, you can see my, my slides? Yes, thank you. You can see the slides, yes. Okay, so first of all, uh, as uh, it has been mentioned, I want to highlight that this has been a project that has involved a lot of organizations, universities, not only in Mexico, but also in the US. And it's a project that started since 2017 um, to try to develop uh, technologies using statistics, machine learning to support the search for missing persons in Mexico. Uh, this is an effort that uh, has been conducted by all of these research centers and NGOs. Uh, and I want to recognize the work that we have done with them because um, uh, it, it couldn't be able if, if only one organization uh, does this uh, job. So first of all, I want to highlight that this is um, a, work, a work that has been conducted with all of them. And here um, I'm going to share, uh, this is what I'm talking about, what I'm going to talk about today. Here's the outline of my presentation. First, I'm going to provide a brief overview or a context of enforced disappearances in Mexico and why we're doing this project. Secondly, I'm going to talk about the spatial model or, or our la latest project to predict the location of unobserved uh, clandestine graves in one specific region in the northwest uh, of Mexico, which is uh, Baja California. And lastly, I'm going to talk about our possible next steps uh, for the project and also open the session for the Q&A. So first of all, uh, it is important to understand uh, why are we doing uh, this project and what is the situation of human rights violations and violence in, in the country. Uh, first of all, it is important to understand that we are documenting enforced disappearances and clandestine graves findings. Uh, enforced disappearances have to be uh, understood um, as a historical phenomenon, not only in Mexico, but also in the region but enforced disappearances are also a local, a national, and an international crime. And enforced disappearances are also a serious uh, human rights violation, uh, also like torture or summary executions. So uh, in Mexico, we have had three periods of disappearances in the, uh, in, in, since the 1960s. The first period is the period known as uh, Guerra Sucia or Dirty War, where disappearances were committed by state actors or uh, against people who they considered uh, political dissidents uh, in the country. These were very uh, uh, specific disappearances committed uh, during, uh, for example, in the south, southern, south, southwestern states of Mexico. Uh, and this, uh, the first uh, disappearance case uh, was recorded in 1966. Uh, second, the, our second period of disappearances was during the, the early 1990s and until the 2000s in the, during the uh, the armed social conflict uh, also in the south southwestern states of Mexico. These were also focalized disappearances and the disappearances were committed by state actors, but disappearances were also uh, committed and there are records of paramilitary or possible paramilitary groups also involved in the disappearances. And lastly, the third period of disappearances is the one that we're experiencing right now. It is a period of disappearances and violence that started uh, during the so-called war against drugs. It is uh, the period that started in, in late 2006, early 2007, uh, due to the strategy of the federal government to use, uh, the, to use armed forces to counter drug-related activities in the country. As a consequence of this uh, violence, such as homicides or disappearances, started to uh, increase in different regions of the country. Uh, because of these disappearances started to be uh, recorded and started to get to gain spotlight not only by, inter by national NGOs or the groups of families who are advocating for the search of their missing, but also it, it started to receive international attention. So for example, in 2011, 
Mexico had the visit of the United Nations Working Group Against Enforced Disappearances or Involuntary Disappearances. And during 2011, during this visit, uh, the working group highlighted that some of the, uh, of, of the events that they uh, were able to document were similar to what uh, international human rights law uh, considers as enforced disappearances. So this was a first uh, major statement and that highlighted the, the crisis of human rights that we are living uh, in Mexico currently. And after this visit, uh, the United Nations Committee on Enforced Disappearances started to, uh, to pay attention to the situation. So in 2015, but also uh, next in 2018, and during the last year in 2022, the Committee on Enforced Disappearances by the, of the United Nations highlighted that the context that Mexico is experiencing a context of widespread disappearances um, in the majority of the territory in Mexico. It is important to consider this because disappearances are happening uh, or have been recorded in the 32 states uh, of Mexico City. And it is also important to consider uh, the magnitude of the phenomenon, right? So currently, uh, according to official figures, in Mexico, we have 109,836 missing persons. These are official statistics. As I've said, the first um, uh, re record of, of, a of a missing person is in 1964. But out of these 109,000 uh, missing persons, the majority of them, 90% of the persons have been uh, registered or recorded after 2006. So this is the period where our project uh, has, has been studying or, or the period that we have been studying. Our efforts to develop technologies and statistics is to understand what has happened in, uh, since 2006 and uh, to the present days. But I wanted to highlight that that this is a historical phenomenon that has occurred since the 1960s uh, in the country. So why are we doing this? Uh, we're doing these uh, technologies or developing these technologies to support the search strategies of authorities who are responsible and have the obligation to conduct the search for missing persons in the country. For example, uh, in 2017, the general law against them for disappearances work was created in Mexico. And this general law creates, for example, institutions and policy programs uh, to search uh, the missing persons. But we are doing this also not, not only to support or to provide information to authorities, but also to support the strategies, the advocacy strategies of uh, groups of families with missing persons, local NGOs and international organizations who are also pushing uh, 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 the, the strategies to uh, to highlight this public problem in, in Mexico, right? So this is a project that started, as I've said, in 2017. Right now, I'm going to talk about our latest um, results and project that has been based in Baja California, Mexico, which is a state in the northwest of the country. And I've, I want to be clear that this project is not necessarily using machine learning. We have used machine learning in, in previous projects to predict, for example, municipalities that could have that have had, that have high probabilities of reporting unobserved clandestine graves. But right now, this approach is a bit different because we are working on a specific region. So we are now we are now using tools related to spatial statistics, spatial analysis, and remote sensing. Although we're not necessarily using uh, machine learning, for example, as um, Yuri showed us in his. Uh, uh, previous presentation. So this project started uh, two years ago uh, because we were able to get information of clandestine graves or mass graves that have been reported or have been found by state authorities, specifically by the Attorney General uh, of the state of Baja California. And this is uh, a data set of 144,000 clandestine graves that we were able to obtain uh, by doing freedom of information requests in Mexico. In Mexico, you can request uh, this type of information to authorities. And if you, it, it is a challenge, but if, if you uh, know how to do the, the questions and sometimes it also involves litigation, you can obtain certain type of information that can be useful for us. So we were able to obtain this data set from uh, the authorities and they gave us a data set of 144 uh, clandestine graves, as, as I've said which 52 of them uh, contain the latitude and longitude coordinates. So this is the, the type of data that we needed uh, to 
uh, create a different approach from the ones that we have done previously. So uh, we knew that if we get uh, if we were able to get the coordinates, we were able to uh, implement different methods from spatial analysis and spatial statistics that I'm going to talk about um, uh, to predict sites um, or to identify sites that have high probabilities of finding new clandestine graves uh, and identifying sites where authorities and groups of missing persons should be focusing uh, their resources. So after obtaining this information, uh, we needed to conduct first verification of the, of the points that were uh, obtained from the Fiscalia, right? So we, we conducted uh, a thorough um, uh, investigation and a thorough data cleaning of the points. We verified if the points, if the coordinates were correctly given, if they made sense to the, uh, to the site that was reported by authorities. And after that, uh, we, we, we were able to uh, leave the 52 uh, coordinates, although we have to highlight that, or to mention that there may, may still be some accur uh, inaccuracy of the points. Uh, so this is also something that has to be taken into consideration for our results. And after um, verifying our points, we were able now to use open source data and, and open source software also to build the spatial models that I'm going to talk about right now. So this new, this new approach in Mexico that we have been conducting is a new geographical model that uh, combines three layers of information or, or three approaches. Uh, where, where the aim of us is to delimit uh, more specific search areas uh, in, in the state of Baja California. As you can see here in the previous slide, Baja California has a mean area of approximately 71,000 um, square kilometers, right? So it's a big territory. So we want to know where we can uh, focus our research, our search strategies to delimit specific areas. So how do we do it? Uh, we develop uh, three geographical layers with three different approaches from spatial statistics and spatial analysis. Uh, the first uh, a layer that we created was using point pattern analysis. That is, we were we anal we analyzed the distribution of the 52 points that we were able to get from the Fiscalia. Then our second uh, layer was creating a, a, a visibility and accessibility uh, layer uh, that we define as clandestine space, which I'm also going to specify uh, right now. And the third layer was to combine these two previous layers with uh, satellite images to identify nit nitrogen concentration also in the region of Baja California. So I'm going to specify uh, what are the three approaches, what are these three approaches and how we're combining them to get our final results. Also, as you can see, there is a link uh, uh, below here, which I think has also been shared uh, in the chat where you can read our new results uh, or the results that I'm uh, presenting here. So if you also have questions after that, um, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, so first we did the point pattern analysis. And this is uh, an approach that we knew that we could replicate from previous works that have been uh, conducted in, in, in areas, for example, of the former Yugoslavia. In fact, uh, this is work that has been done uh, uh, from other colleagues of us, and I'm happy to see that one of them is, is right now here in the talk. So um, yeah, big, um, um, hello, Derek. <laughs> um, um, so this uh, uh, methodology that we knew that we could replicate if we got uh, the coordinates from the points. As you can see, the, the dots in the map are the, the 52 points uh, that have the coordinates uh, or that we were able to obtain with coordinates from uh, the clandestine graves. So the first thing that we wanted to do is to identify the patterns or, or the distribution of these points. Specifically, we wanted to know if these points follow like a clustering pattern or, or, are, or if they are randomly distributed. Why it is important to know this? If the, putter, if, if the points are following a clustering pattern, then we can identify or, or do statistical inference to try to estimate uh, possible distances of where other uh, graves might be found. And also, it is important to understand if, if the clandestine graves are following a clustering pattern or a random pattern to also get some, some ideas of, the of how the perpetrators are uh, doing uh, these acts, right? So as you can see, already from the map, uh, you can see that it, there is some clustering, right? For example, in the top left, there are the hidden graves that have been found in the city near Tijuana. Uh, and also in the near right in, in, in Mexicali, which is the capital of the state. 
And we can already start detecting that there are in, in fact some uh, some clustering patterns in 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 the state. But how did we confirm this? We decided to do two statistical tests uh, to confirm clustering. The first test that we did or we conducted is a test called average nearest neighbors. Average nearest neighbor is a special statistic uh, technique that tells you if the point pattern that you're analyzing, you're, that you're analyzing is, has significant clustering or the points are following a random pattern. So what we identified with this first test is that in fact, the clandestine graves that have been found in the state of Baja California by the local attorney's office are clustered. There is a, a statistically significant clustering in, in the groups. So for example, what we found is that uh, clandestine graves in the region uh, are uh, have a seven, seven kilometers mean, mean distance between them. So if, if, if the phenomena was to be random, the, the mean distance would be 16 kilometers instead of seven kilometers. So that's how we were able to know that in fact, we are, we are identifying a clustering pattern uh, in the region. After doing this test, we were able to do another sp spatial statistic test uh, called replace k function. What does replace k function does? Uh, it is also uh, a spatial statistic a test that allows to identify clusters in the points, but it also allows us to make inference about possible new uh, distances of points. So what do I mean with this? After conducting the replay k function, uh, we identify that there's also clustering uh, based on this test, but we were also able to identify or understand uh, the distances, the possible distances where we can find new graves that have not been uh, uh, reported based on, on the locations from previous graves. So for example, if we start, if we stand uh, in an observed clandestine grave that has been reported from, by the authorities and walk 18, between 18 and, and 28 kilometers, there is a high probability of finding more graves that have, been, uh, that have not yet been found or, or remain unobserved. So with this approximation, we were able to first reduce the search areas or possible old or potential search areas uh, uh, in the region. But this is still uh, one test that we had to do, but we still have to deal with a lot of uh, variables and a lot of context that we still don't know. So after doing this first layer, we decided to do our, uh, our, our second layer or geographical layer. And it's the layer that we called clandestine space. What do we mean by clandestine space? Uh, clandestine space is following theories for, theories, for example, of environmental criminology. And it is uh, related to the legal nature of the phenomena, right? So for example, uh, usually perpetrators require uh, to choose uh, hidden places where they can conduct uh, these, these crimes, right? Because they don't want to be found. Uh, they usually prefer to travel or to uh, communicate in places they already know. Um, so there's like a rational um, choice or a rational act with, uh, of the act of commu committing the disappearances and the, and the graves. So these uh, environmental criminology theories can be quantified and can be um, uh, developed in, in spatial layers. So what we did is that we created uh, two layers in, in Baja California. One is an accessibility layer, and another layer is a visibility layer. So what do I mean with this? For the accessibility layer, uh, we identified the, the mean travel times, for example, from big uh, uh, cities uh, to other regions of, of, of the state. So for example, if, if we are in, in Tijuana or in Mexicali, the capital state of, of Baja California, we calculated how much does it takes us to move from these cities to other regions of, of the state within minutes, right? So for example, if I want to move to, I don't know, the nearest city, it would take me 30 minutes. And after that to the other nearest city, it would take me one, um, one hour and then two hours and so forth. So with that, we created uh, a mean uh, travel distance time for all, all the state for accessibility. And then for visibility, we created random points also in, in, in the state to establish what we call view sheds. View sheds, uh, what in, uh, basically what they do is we calculate how far a person can see uh, in, in different uh, 
parts of the region and how and how uh, and how that visibility is obstructed by for example trees uh, canyons uh, 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 buildings etc so what the view shed tells us is how far we can see or how far um, we are not able to see so for example the green what we can see here in the green images is that uh, is uh, spots where clandestine graves have been found in, in, in Baja California. So the green, the green areas in the right tell us uh, if we stand in that point, how far or how much can we see uh, from that place, right? So our, so our hypothesis is that uh, perpetrators that conduct uh, disappearances and then uh, clandestine graves usually prefer places that can be easily accessed by by car in time but that are hidden that are are very difficult to view from within because they don't want to be uh, uh, identified or found what they are doing right so this is the concept of clandestine space and indeed what we found is that uh, 41 of the 52 uh, points in baja california uh, are clustered or uh, uh, lie within uh, this with, with areas in, in the state that have high accessibility but low, but low visibility. So in fact, we were able to confirm uh, that our hypothesis uh, uh, was true. So it, with, by combining these two layers, uh, the point pattern analysis for the distances and the clandestine space, we were able to reduce the search areas even more uh, for the state of Baja California. So after delimiting our possible search areas, we decided to include a final layer uh, using satellite images from uh, a, a satellite called Sentinel-2. Can we have about two more minutes or three more minutes so yep. we have a conversation? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm almost finishing. Um, so yes, uh, our final layer, what it does, it's we are taking nitrogen concentration uh, uh, um, the, uh, points uh, that can be identified uh, from the satellite images. Why are we doing this? because when uh, bodies are buried, uh, they start to decompose. And from this body de decomposition, we can find, for example, nitrogen and chlorophyll and chlorophyll. So these nitrogen and chlorophyll uh, patterns can be, can be identified using satellite images using an index called uh, the RESI uh, index or the Red Edge Chlorophyll Index. So with this, we were able to identify uh, specific zones in, in, in the state of Baja California that have uh, a unusual patterns of the distributions of nitrogen. This is also a hypothesis that we have uh, there. We have conducted a specific uh, control tests in some of the regions, but, we, but it, this is something that has not been yet um, used in, in real uh, scenarios of, of, of search uh, strategies in the country. But this is how we were also able to identify more specific areas of, of or potential search areas in Baja California. So after combining our three layers, we were able to reduce the potential search areas in Baja California to a 78%. So what you can see here in the map is the uh, areas colored in yellow are air and areas colored in red. The areas, the areas that are colored in red are the potential search zones that we believe uh, we should be focusing for to conduct new searches of clandestine graves and, and missing persons. So lastly, um, the next steps, and we can leave it also for the Q&A, is we want to keep on reducing the potential search areas. Uh, this involves uh, obtaining new data, doing more field work with NGOs and the groups of families that work within that area. We also want to identify the specific patterns of enforced disappearances uh, or context analysis within the area of Baja California, which will also help us reduce the uncertainty and model and create different models. And of course, we want to implement these findings uh, uh, to support the search strategies of missing uh, of groups of missing family persons of, of, of groups with families with missing persons in the country. And hopefully, we want to replicate also these. Uh, this methodology to other states, not only in Baja California. So um, thank you very much. Um, I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much.